How's everybody doing? Great. Day three. <laughs> cool. So, um, welcome to the governance panel. The title of this panel is Governance How to Lose Friends and Alienate People. Can we get the accurate time on the clock? It's not 25 minutes. Oh, oh should I fix that right away? Can you guys change that time? It's 50 minutes, I think. Sorry, you have to bear with us for 50 minutes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this is an important 50 minutes. Hopefully, we'll be careful. Terrible. <gasps> nice, nice, nice. Cool. So, um, my name is Anna. I am the co-host of a podcast called The Zero Knowledge Podcast with Frederick here. He's my co-host. Um, we're joined, or I'm joined today, actually, by three people from four different ecosystems <laughs> to talk about governance in their respective ecosystems, and hopefully we get a chance to also touch on the Zcash governance a little bit. Um, as we learned yesterday from a very wise man, and I paraphrase, decentralized blockchain governance is like a bicycle for your soul. If the bicycle was an upside down tricycle and your soul was on fire, <laughs> surrounded by tweets, your soul is in hell. I can't do it. You, you, anyway, I'm trying to do it justice here. But So this is a pretty dark picture. <laughs> Alienating friends. Bicycles on fire. Anyway, all sorts of kind of negative imagery here. But I think the, the goal of this panel is to hopefully shed some light on what's out there, what's kind of working, what hasn't been working. And I think governance seems to be kind of like a messy process. Um, and we're going to try to do our best to shed some light on it. We're going to solve it in we're, 48 we're, minutes. So. We're not, OK. Um, let's start by describing. What I'm, what I'm going to ask the panelists to do is describe the ecosystem that they work with, how long it's live, because that's quite important, I think, how big is the community, and roughly how does the governance work, maybe something that's unique about it. Uh, Frederick, you want to start? Yeah, sure. Uh, my name is Frederick, CTO of Credity Technologies, and uh, I would say I come from kind of two communities, so I've obviously been deeply involved in Ethereum for many years, and, and we're, we're working a lot with that, uh, but more recently we're working on a protocol called Polkadot, and uh, that's, I think, where we bring a lot of our governance learnings to as well, so I'm mainly going to focus on Polkadot, but we'll obviously have thoughts on Ethereum governance as well. Um, yeah, hi, I'm Adrian. I'm the founder of Cryptium Labs, or one of the founders of Cryptium Labs. Um, I'm also coming from actually two ecosystems, so I've been a long time, long time involved in Cosmos, um, and we run a validator there, and I'm also, uh, we're also running a large validator on Tezos now. Um, and I can sort of give you briefly an overview actually of how the governance systems work in both systems, mostly because they're, it's kind of funny, like the, uh, I think they're very sort of, they could be combined quite well. So Cosmos has this uh, pure text proposal signaling process that I think gives a lot of voice to everyone in the community because anyone can sort of like write a markdown document and describe what they'd like to see. But at that stage, it becomes very unclear what is supposed to happen next, like who implements it and how that impl implementation works. And sort of Tezos is totally on the other side where it's like there are no text proposals, there's no signaling right now. It's only like, someone writes a bunch of camel code and then injects the hash of that or camel code into the protocol into the protocol and then people vote on that hash and if it gets accepted by governance it's all nodes automatically download that ha that code and compile it and dynamically link it into the runtime uh, so two very opposing things but i think like in my opinion like one of the ideal ones will is maybe a combination of those um, yeah. and how long have they been oh, how long have they been live? um right tezos about a year um, in terms of community, yes, I think in the fundraiser there were about 30,000 unique wallets. Um, there are right now about uh, 450 individual bakers. So bakers are what Tezos calls validators. Uh, within Cosmos, I think six months now, roughly live, um, there are 100 validators due to um, using Tenement BFT, uh, which sort of for now puts a limit on this, even though that, I think that limit could be way higher. Um, and I think there were 1,000 fundraiser participants. 10,000 wallets right now, cool. Cool, uh, hey guys, I'm Lane. I do various eclectic things in the Ethereum community, including talk a lot about governance. 
Um, I think most people in the room are probably familiar with Ethereum. It's been live for about four years. It's the second largest blockchain by sort of market cap. Um, very hard to know how big the community is. It's actually sort of one of the things we talk about when we talk about governance is trying to understand what we mean by the community, right? It's this term that we all kind of invoke a lot, um, I think, without really knowing exactly who those people are or what that means. It's in the tens of thousands. That's sort of ballpark what I'd guess, like that order of magnitude. Uh, I think what's unique about Ethereum governance is uh, total lack of governance, mostly. So we can talk more about that. Um, so we, we have that in common with Bitcoin. We kind of inherit that from Bitcoin, in particular, the kind of social side of governance. Uh, we, so to be clear, we have like a de facto technical governance process. Obviously, we have this e these things called EIPs, and they uh, some black magic happens and kind of upgrades the network do happen, technical upgrades. Um, so yeah, so I'd say it's, it's the unique factor is the kind of total lack of like social governance, um, very informal off-chain governance, uh, which I guess in some way contrasts to the other platforms that are, we're, we'll be discussing today. Um, and then sort of a very tiny piece of formalized governance, which is the EIP process. So why do you think, I'm gonna start real kind of high level. Why do you think governance is such a controversial topic? Why do you think it's such a challenge? Anyone can answer it. <laughs> uh, like, it's sort of a question, right? Um, there are always some people that feel misrepresented, some people who are massively benefiting from the current system. And I think sort of, it, it's to some extent historic path dependence that like the first systems launched without, gov without formalized governance. And so a bunch of structures evolved around how, like, we should make no mistake, like Bitcoin and Ethereum are governed. Like things without governance still have like an underlying process that sort of informs how these communities evolve. It's just not a very transparent, open process on how that necessarily works. And I think sort of the mode has become that like if you are one of the early adopters there and you sort of have a large, um, like, large say in this undefined governance process, uh, you stand a lot to lose. Um, from it changing. From that changing. And I think sort of the new networks will have a way easier time adopting governance because they sort of launched with it. Um, and I think the mode is that people try to gain an influence over the exist the like on chain governance system. I think but that's like way more transparent. One of the reasons it's so controversial, I think, is it's one of the most important problems though. Like we can build a technical platform to to do blockchain things, and we kind of know how to do that, and you know we still have a long ways to go in terms of improvement, scalability, et cetera. But all of that is pointless unless it is actually decentralized in how it operates as well. If it is one entity completely controlling this tech platform, then it's still not decentralized. And the goal is truly a decentralized internet, then how that internet is governed also needs to be decentralized. And that's what we've seen with with the old internet is there are a few parties who control everything and you know, effectively govern the internet. And, and that's kind of what we want to avoid. So the question is, how do we avoid that? Everyone has opinions. Everyone feels entitled to have say in this world. And uh, like, as opposed to technical governance where people are fine saying like, I don't know this stuff, I'll let someone else do it. Everyone feels like they should have a say in social governance. Two, two, so I agree with that completely. Two, two thoughts here, I think, if we zoom way, way, way out. So, so zoom out from kind of blockchain, crypto, uh, 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 echo chamber to kind of the internet, and then zooming way out to like a level of humanity, like governance is just hard, right? Like yeah. aggregating, I mean, I'm not a political theorist. I'm actually like trying to learn things like political philosophy and get smart on all this stuff. Like it's not a new category of inquiry. It's not a new problem. Aggregating human preferences is just by definition a very hard thing to do because we're very complex, right? We have very incompatible kind of uh, needs and kind of goals. Especially um, the bigger you get. The bigger you get, exactly. The and so I would say... are a bit easier, I think. Oh, absolutely. The community of 100 people is like relatively straightforward. It's like there's some amount of consensus. So um, we've sort of, like as a species, with very few exceptions, kind of landed on this system past 100 years, 200 years, like kind of, I mean, I'm, this is reductionist, but we have this nation state system and kind of the, the, you know, the ultimate authority is like the use of force, right? We have like, we have armies, we have kind of sanctioned, um, you know, state sanctioned violence, right? That's kind of the, the bedrock of like, I think the, the, the kind of governance system that whereby, you know, the world sort of more or less somehow functions today. 
And I think one of our challenges, just to go straight to the heart, is that we, like, we're not okay with that, right? Like we're throwing violence away and kind of trying to replace it with this beautiful new superpower called the fork. So a well-functioning governance process and uses that governance process to evolve rapidly towards like product market fit for that platform, but ultimately have a really good chance of winning. And so I think the old projects, they have to compete on two fronts, right? They have to compete on solving governance and also solving the technical challenges that come with like wanting more and more global adoption of these systems. What do you think about that thing? Do you think it's possible to add, do you think it will ever be successful to like really add new governance structures on existing, like big? Who I respect, but has a varying degree of opinions on governance. Uh, he always brings up this concept of legitimacy, yeah. and uh, I think it's valid in this in this context of saying, you know, we set out with this in mind, and therefore it is legitimate, and, and people will follow it and be happy. But if you set up with no governance in mind, you explicitly say like we're the chain without governance, and then you try to bring it in. Now it's someone trying to capture the system. It's also well, to recapture the system from the existing. Yeah, when there is no structure, like where are decision making? Where is it happening? So that's that's this is this is my favorite and simultaneously least favorite topic. So this is the tyranny of structurelessness, right? Like upside down so, tricycle on fire. What's that? It's an upside down tricycle on fire. Yeah, and, and my soul is on fire too when I think about it. But it, so uh, I'll just. 60 seconds, like, so if you haven't, like, read this, there's an incredible piece from the 70s. I believe the author's name is Joe Freeman. I hope I got that right. It's called The Tyranny of Structurelessness, and uh, it, it, it's completely different context, right? It has to do with, like, the women's rights movement, different time, different place, different group. But when I read it, it, like, literally sent shivers down my spine, literally, because I identified so strongly. I was like, this is exactly what's happening in Ethereum today. And in a nutshell, uh, it's a very simple idea, right? It's that there is no such thing as a lack of structure in human society. And when there is no explicit structure, then implicit structure just emerges and this elite class develops. And so the answer to your question is the way decisions get made is uh, backroom politics and people having drinks at you know events like this. And that, I'm not okay with that personally. So that's the risk. Do you think though like decentralization, like formalization in decentralized spaces seems to be counterintuitive or it seems to be easily rejected. Are there any examples of other open source or decentralized communities where this formalization was accepted. But but aren't sort of Polkadot and Tezos and Cosmos, like they, there is yeah. formalization there, right? Yeah. So I think we shouldn't confuse formalization with centralization, right? There's sort of, you can have a very decentralized ecosystem, a very decentralized community, but everyone has sort of this clear idea of what the rules are. Um, so in the open source space, I don't know necessarily actually, because like very few open source projects had to um, sustain this kind of rapid growth plus huge amounts of monetary influx. Um, and we've never seen any like existing system having to deal with this, so I, say, I think they may actually be the wrong places to look for. Um, interesting enough though, um, like you could argue around this, but um, the German federalist model is can be argued that within the model of a state, it's fairly decentralized. Um, people have like fa fairly good representation, you have the federal states that have uh, influence over the federal politics, you, so it's like, it's a well balanced system. And I think the only reason why that works is because it's like very well codified on like how decisions get made, how people get elected, how you form these governing bodies around this. I think there are some examples from open source, especially if we look at like programming languages. So you know, I work in the Rust programming language. It sustains a lot more development than many blockchain projects. And like um, has, uh, it sort of started out with Mozilla backing it, and they're now moving away from it a little bit. They want to resign that responsibility and make it a more of a community project. So they're like making a very explicit effort to formalize governance and like allow more participation in it. And uh, I think there's definitely interesting parallels as well. So, so far it sounds though like all three of you are pro-formalization. What is the argument against it? We need someone up here to do it. Yeah, I mean, I think in a nutshell, any, so I'm, I'm channeling her. <laughs> Join us, Vlad. So um, any attempt to kind of formalize or institutionalize, I think is the terminology he would use, right? Any system of governance whatsoever, by definition, uh, disenfranchises some people. Because there's no perfect system of governance. So that's the risk. Do you guys agree with that? Uh, yeah. Of course, this I is like the, the risk exists right now, right? Like the current Ethereum governance process clearly disenfranchises some parts of the communities. Like I think like 
the like one of the main arguments around sort of like job normalization is that oh we don't want changes we don't want to spend time for people, but realistically you just you, you tr there's no way to build a perfect system right like it's sort of be oblivious to believe that tomorrow I can write a paper that has a perfect governance system for a fourteen billion dollar cryptocurrency it's like doesn't work, um, but I think we sh should have focused on sort of like making incremental improvements along the way right like the system doesn't have to be perfect it just has to be slightly better than the previous system it's like a slight improvement to probably adopt. I feel like there's like complex system dynamics at play here though, right? Again, I mean, this is way beyond my expertise, but like what I'm getting at is this goes back to meta governance, right? There's sort of like there's like a there's like a continuum or a spectrum. And if you don't get those initial parameters right, if you don't get that that um, that kind of meta governance right out of the gate, then I think that kind of over time most of these systems will find one equilibrium or another, but that equilibrium like like things may not get better. They may tend to get worse. And and what I mean by that is like things like wealth and power tend to centralize over time in general. And so we need to be very mindful about institutionalizing specific mechanisms to counteract that. And I don't think that we've done that. I don't think that most governments have done that. I, I don't know if, yeah, I don't necessarily agree with the disenfranchising because I think any government system will disenfranchise people. It's just you're, you're, you have no good choice. Um, but the, the sanest uh, arguments I've heard against uh, formalized governance is that if you, like, rules are made to be gamed, Lay out the rules very clearly, then right. it's open to analysis and it's open to gaming the rules and trying to figure out how to break the rules. And it's easier to break the rules if they're very clearly defined. Whereas if they're completely undefined, it's sort of like, well, now I need to get, you know, become friends with Vitalik as the first step. And that so, so that's true, right? But, but 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 let's be very clear: like rules also are designed to protect people if the rules are designed well. And in the complete absence of rules, you know, you you disenfranchise almost everybody except those people who happen to know whoever that person in charge may be, yeah. right? I was going to say that too. That was actually the point I was going to make. Was the argument I've heard most against formalization is the gameability, and this kind of brings us to the question of like, in these governance systems, you have a community. If it's formalized, those rules could be gamed. If it's unformalized, Twitter wins, it seems, or something. So I'm curious what you guys think about that. So I don't actually think that Twitter wins. I think that's sort of a misconception that, um, like, that I think. There's a disproportionate amount of people being very loud on Twitter and Reddit, but I think they hold very little influence over the actual. Really? Decision. I completely disagree. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so it scares people. People get extremely it, so worried about their, health, so the, their safety. For, their... for Ethereum, this may be different, but so far for Tezos, I think there's sort of a sort of uncorrelated almost. Like the louder you are on Twitter, or like yeah, the very loud Twitter followers don't necessarily correlate to what token holders would actually vote for. So if you take the subset of like coin holder voting then it's like, I think Twitter's a very bad metric to like gauge what the community thinks. But I think that relates to how you do community building. So Ethereum started out like Reddit was the place for the Ethereum community, and this is where we exist. And then it kind of became Twitter, and this is where people go to look for their news, for their opinions. And you know, once the, you know, the loud negative voices started taking over those spaces, where else to go? And uh, I think that's why they actually rule Ethereum. Um, but where if you have conscious community building where you set out to say, you know, we're, we're going to have a code of conduct, we're going to right. have a forum where trolls aren't allowed, um, then that becomes a much more sane you know, place to discuss things. And I don't think the trolls on Twitter will have at all as much power. But I mean, even the Ethereum community does have like ETH research and. Yeah, initiatives. but it was never in place from the beginning. And that's a problem. Like, it's not a legitimate forum because it wasn't there. Well, it's become legitimate. I think that E3 Search and Fellowship of Ethereum Magicians forums, and now there's a ETH Hub forum, a community forum. I think those are gaining in legitimacy. Are they are they moderated? Very lightly. Um, oh, why? I mean, yes, there is an administrator on all of them, but I'm not aware of any um, like controversies around things like censorship on any of those forums. I mean, because that's always going to be. Uh, I'd say because the front. trolls haven't found them. <laughs> Amazing. <right? laughs> I guess if you talk a lot about cryptography, then the trolls get scared away. So out of the learned. ecosystems that are here, um, what, how, how focused, like in terms of implementation of a new protocol or a new idea, how interested are they in the community's voice? Like how strong is the community proposals in each of these? Because it's quite different from what I understand. I mean, Polkadot sets out to have completely different governance. Everything is on-chain. Every proposal has to come with code. Uh, you know, discussion is attached to that piece of code that is the proposal. Um, you know, voting happens on chain, so it's very, it's very much in the opposite direction where we are explicitly trying to establish all of the rules, not only of like technical upgrades, but how you discuss things and where, and and try to figure out like 
a system that works. In this respect, it's the anti-Ethereum kind of yeah. thing. It's the and, furthest uh, extreme of <laughs> Indeed. And, and uh, like, I, I, I am worried that we won't get the rules right and it will be gameable, but then at least you have meta governance. You can, you can put forth a proposal to change how the governance works and clearly define those rules. I think as engineers, we're a lot better at defining rules and laying things out than navigating this sort of weird social space of uh, you know, off-chain governance. Should the engineers define those rules? I think it's reasonable that they do, given that they're building the protocol, yeah. So I agree with that. Like, if people want to sort of have, someone has to build it, and uh, it, it's very difficult to go from so someone writes some high-level description, and then like the implementation almost never looked like this. But I had an interesting conversation with a lawyer in Switzerland about this, who um, was actually, so I, like, I wrote like a contract, and um, then afterwards I gave it to a lawyer to like review, and he was like, Engineers write incredibly good contracts because it's sort of like just like step by step like this has to be checked 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 These are all the things that govern the contract done So I actually think engineers may be very good at designing sort of high-level governance systems where it's just like These people are listened to these people now have a choice like someone uploads a proposal people get to vote on it it's like, yeah. So should we get into the popcorn part of the panel here? Right. We've been real nice all, all yeah, panel. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna push back pretty strongly on this. Okay. I, I actually think the engineers are awful at governance. Uh, I think that it's super hubristic of, of us to kind of say that okay. as engineers, right? Like we're, oh boy, in case, is it for us or is it for them? need them. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Fight. So this is, this, is, this is a new meme, right? Governance panels have to have popcorn, just remember that. Um, I think that, uh, yeah, I think it's very hubristic and very naive of us to think that like we um, could just de design good governance systems in the first place. But more to the point, like it, it depends on the scope of the project, right? If if what you're trying to build is like uh, a little sandbox, right, for us to play in, right, us as like the people in this room or the people on this stage, like sure, by all means, like design it, build it for yourselves, no worries, right? But like very very explicitly, the goal of projects like uh, like Zcash and like Ethereum is much larger than that, right? That's, we're, we're trying to build a, something for billions of humans. I, I know some of the um, Zcash folks have said that here, and I feel that way about Ethereum. Like, how absurd is it for us to think that as engineers and as a very homogenous group who share a lot of attributes, I'm not gonna list them, because every time I do, I get in trouble, um, <laughs> that we can design a system for all humans? That's crazy. But we're not trying to. We're trying to exactly. design a system that works for the next year, and then try to be more inclusive over time. And at in 50 years, we might get like might have achieved enough inclusivity to have a system that works for everyone. I disagree. This, you got, you have to get this stuff. You have to get this stuff right out of the gate. I'm sorry, but like it goes back to that meta governance thing. Like a system it's that not works for us. possible to build a system that works for 50 billion people that on day one. We should have never launched um, any proof of stake coin because like they're not inherently flawless. Like we're not going to build systems that like the current consensus algorithms, no matter which ones, will not scale to seven billion people. Inherently, we cannot design, like, if we always strive for perfection, we will never do anything useful because we'll always just, like, sit in talks and, like, discuss how to, like, tweak it. I think, like, what we really need to focus on is, is incremental improvements over time. That, like, we say the community of, I don't know, 5,000, 50,000 people right now, this governance system works for this, and let's have a process by which we can amend the governance process over time as the community grows. It's, st it's still recursive, though, right? Like. Like, it's, me it's a meta governance question. We're not gonna get the governance right today, but we need to get the meta governance right today. We need to build a platform that we can continue to iterate on and improve, and it's not like, clear to me that we're doing it. It almost what, sounds what? like what you're talking about is also like values, like setting values sure. or like those intentions for future and making those somehow like... And, and part of it, by the way, is not deciding certain things today because just admitting like the, the limitations of our knowledge and right, like that there are things that other communities uh, value or their needs that we may not be familiar with. What does it mean to get it in terms of the meta governance? Because to me, this very much means um, you want to have a system that like doesn't fall over in the next two years, that is not easily captured by um, like some minority of the population, that is ideally resilient to at least 51% attacks, uh, right? Like, like getting it right is like a very can be a very constrained parameter set actually, because like we don't have to get it right for five billion people. You know, I think we do have to get it right. <laughs> we haven't gotten anything right so far. So right. it's also like, that, should yeah. we just shut down all of the projects because they're not right? Uh, yeah, I think that the ones that, that suck should be, like, we should fix them. And if we can't fix them, then we should tear them down and build fork, better ones. Fork them? Yeah. Sure, that's one way of doing it, yeah. I kind of want to talk about a topic that also touches the Zcash community a little bit. Um, I know that, so the topic would be founders reward slash block rewards. Block rewards? No. We, yeah. yeah. What did you Same, call them? Uh, block then? rewards, yeah. Um, so I like that example because you see in that um, a protocol that had it built into the system from the start, 
versus a protocol that tried to propose it after the fact four years later, and you saw a very dramatic and different reaction. I think this kind of is relevant to the Zcash community today because the founders' rewards, as I understand, are going to end unless some decision is taken. October 2020. Okay. It's, it's funny, there's a funny... I'm speaking to the community who knows this better than I. There's, but... a, there's a funny symmetry here, because we are beginning, we're having kind of this little little tempest in a teapot struggle in the Ethereum community about instituting block rewards uh, as a form of kind of ecosystem funding or funding the public good. And uh, the, the symmetry here is that the Zcash community is trying to figure out what to do when they end. That would be a good problem for us to have. Like, I what think you... the, like, I don't know where, I think calling it founders reward is maybe a bad idea. Um, yeah, so it's like very specific to founders. R Not branding is important, right? Yeah, like, <laughs> names matter. Um, but I think, generally speaking, it's an incredibly important idea to have to build a governance system that your chain supports funding the de core development. Right? Like Ethereum was incredibly good at figuring out business models and financial models for application developers. Right? Like DApps made billions of dollars, um, but at the same time, it, Ethereum figured nothing out in terms of how to fund core development. Um, and this is sort of like you had to ask the Ethereum Foundation for a grant, or you had to be friends with Joseph Lubin or Vitalik to like get consensus funding. But it's like very limited, and it's sort of incredible to think, right? Tezos has this right now, where it's like you can attach an invoice to a protocol, right? And sort of like anyone writes code, and if it gets accepted, they get paid. But like, just like I think people underestimate the power that governance systems and chains by themselves have. Imagine if you're valued a billion dollars market cap right now, and you can possibly print 10 to 20 percent inflationary development funding for core dev uh, every year. So like a chain valued a billion dollars can print between 100 to 200 million dollars to like make sure that the technology they're running is by far the best in this space. And I think it, like, the first system that figures out how to do this effectively like, has such a high chance to, uh, to win. And that's why I'm like, super pro, not calling fun rewards, but like, paying for core dev. I, th I think like, to um, paraphrase uh, Gavin in some, some recent talk of his, he um, saying that you know, as the, the governance of a blockchain has an incredible amount of capital at its disposal. And the, the role of good governance is to responsibly wield that capital and pay for things that are useful to the, to the chain. And um, you know, th there's this weird concept that all core developers should work for free. And uh, like we, we want it to be an open source system where everyone comes in and contributes. But you know, we, we see that in the open source world, and it doesn't really even work there. So why are we trying to replicate that? I think the idea here, though, was that like, because you're going to own tokens and the tokens will go up in value, then you can work for free. At least but that worked until it didn't. Like, yeah, exactly. And, it doesn't, and it doesn't this work only now. works if you have a founder's reward, right? And this yeah. only works for one specific right. subset of people that have tokens from the beginning. It's not scalable, I think, and, and not yeah. sustainable. Like, you want to have 1,000 to 10,000 people working on core instead of working on like, useless applications that don't currently deliver any value to the real world um, in order to make these systems good. Yeah, I, like, think, yeah. I think Parity is a perfect example here. We came in after Ethereum was already alive and we started working on it. We didn't have any stake in Ethereum at all when we started working on it. And so it's like, do you want that kind of people, like companies and other parties to come in after the fact? Or do you just want the people who were there day one to keep working for the project for the next 50 years? But how, like, how are those post-Genesis companies actually incentivized? They're like not. In the case of Parity, it's like the client exists and yep. is worked on and it, the miners don't pay. No, the, and uh, we, we've received a very generous grant from the Ethereum Foundation to be able to stay alive and that's awesome, but it's not a sustainable business model. It's a, that's not how you know, core development should work. There should be re some reward for it. And there's also a very strange misconception. I, I see this like in the Zcash forums as well, that like, there, there seems to be this idea that there's a, you know, the founders rewards for, for, for four years of work and then after the four years of work, Zcash was supposed to be done, and then we all go home, and now Zcash exists, and it's done. But that's not how any software works in the world. <laughs> like, you need continued development always. So, so Zcashers, if you're listening, don't kill your founder's reward. <laughs> Take it from us. Rename it. That's cool, right? Um, but OK, but, but to, I mean, you guys know, obviously, I'm on your side here. As a core developer, I strongly agree with an Ethereum core developer. I strongly agree with this. But to play devil's advocate, right, Bitcoin you know, still exists. Maybe it's not like evolving as rapidly. Um, and they kind of, they, they're ultra libertarian and they kind of believe the private market should fund this stuff. So like, could that work for us? What would have to happen for that to work for us? Do we have to have funding for the public good? The thing is, I would view governance systems for chains as, as the private market. Like they can be a responsible investor. Like, you know, like as you were saying, like, it's like you have access to capital, wield it responsibly, try to grow the value of your token. Um, 
it's like I wouldn't say that like if you have founders reward or dev funds, whatever um, capital coming through inflationary funding, this isn't that people are being subsidized. No, this is like a governance system wielding its power. So the, okay, this to, gets to, yeah. com, to outcompete the private, like to win in the private market. This gets to this really interesting question, which is yeah, I don't know if we should go into it. Which is kind of like, are blockchains a public good or not? Are they like a commons? Are they a private thing? That's a really interesting question, but I don't have an answer to it. Uh, your point's interesting, though. Could private industry fund the core development? And for one thing, that requires that there is a private industry around what, whatever sure. you're doing, which is not the case for most blockchains. Um, but, but to be clear, right? Parity is a private for-profit yeah. company. So yeah, but we're exactly, but like. We're not earning money off the work that we're doing because we're at, at layer one, because we're doing core stuff. If we were at layer two, we're providing uh, like vendor solutions or like point of sale products to, to marketplaces, then maybe you know, some of that would actually be profitable and we could put money back into core development. But that doesn't exist. And the only thing that really exists like in the, in the Ethereum world are ICOs. And ICOs have made tons and tons of money. They very heavily rely on and very they ask very specific and very demanding questions of the core dev teams, but they have no interest in paying for any of it. So it's also like we've seen this attempt in Ethereum and it hasn't worked. So with the private, I think there is a point that um, sort of as blockchains mature, you want to have some enterprise company or like larger companies that sort of build real world applications that um, also this development. The problem is if that's the only source of revenue for core dev, um, you end up in this massively captured environment where like three large companies will determine what gets built and what doesn't. And I, I don't think like this doesn't follow the ethos of decentralization at all. And I don't think most communities want this kind of capture by large established companies to happen over their chains. Yeah. But if the chains themselves aren't willing to pay for it, this is eventually what happens. I mean, it's not even eventually. Like, Ethereum is captured today by the Ethereum Foundation and consensus, right? All due respect to those two organizations. They're, they're, I'm not saying they're evil organizations, but you know, they control the lion's share of the resources and as a result wield the, you know, the lion's share of kind of the decision making power. So yeah, in a more efficient market, maybe it would work, but like we're not there yet. So I have kind of two directions we could take this. One is we could continue, one of the questions or things I want to talk about is a little bit more about how the community decision making, if you are including the community, could potentially happen, because I know that that's something that Zcash is looking at. The other option that I have now, though, is to open the floor to hear a few questions, because we are in the middle of the Zcash, Zcon conference, and we aren't necessarily the people to speak on that, but if there is somebody who has a question or something that they could comment regarding that, I think would be really interesting. Community. Okay, so we'll start with community, and then we'll go there. Oh, sorry. By community, I meant audience. Oh, you mean sorry. this community? This okay, community. <laughs> this community. I just thought I was surprised. Okay, so that that is actually the question to you guys. If you have any questions or you want to start a conversation right here, please feel free. And in the meantime, we can keep chatting. But if you want to, I think just come up to the mic here, and then we'll do that. So why don't I? Right, we've got one. Oh, we have one already. Okay, cool. Yay. Two. Hi. Um, I represent more the users of any cryptocurrency not a developer or a cryptographer. When I, it took me a while to get BTC and then Z, uh, Zcash. Now it's gonna take me more to understand governance and the layer two. So when I look at it, the question is to you, when I look, for example, if I want to look at the 30, 30 second uh, elevator pitch for Bitcoin, I look at it, it's decentralized money for everyone, no control. Zcash, it's private, Bitcoin. Can you give me an elevator pitch of whatever you want to say Cosmos or Polkadot or ETH2, where it's easy for someone who doesn't understand the whole thing. I found it very difficult to explain to people. And, and what I'm seeing that we're making things more complicated that people will never, the, the way I look at it, are we trying to get people to understand, understand what's going on? Or we're we trying to help people. I, don't, I really don't think people will ever understand, normal person. I, I mean, that's, someone in that's, the street. That question actually was a little bit about this community involvement. It, le it lent itself to that, which is like, should, what you're asking here is maybe for, for you guys to clarify what the different ecosystems are, because we didn't, maybe we didn't do that clearly at the beginning. But um, I think it also speaks to how educated, how involved, to what level is a participant in an ecosystem before they are included in the governance process or should be included uh, in the yeah, governance process. Like, we are phenomenally bad in this industry to explain things <laughs> and yeah. talk about what we're doing or why we're doing it. And this is and, what we do uh, every week. And Still indeed, like uh, getting users to understand a concept like governance is, uh, I know, it's beyond me. <laughs> but <laughs> we, get, we can do the elevator pitches of the project as well. 
Uh, I can give you like the two ones for Tezos and Cosmos. Tezos, secure formally verified smart contracts, most likely for the decentralized finance space, generally like financial products. Cosmos, the interwebs, the internet of blockchains, connecting blockchains together to in order to allow value transfer between them. That's like the five cent pitches for either. Polkadot is a blockchain innovation and interoperability platform. Oh boy. <laughs> Ethereum is like very complex and if you look at it from 10 different perspectives or 10 different people may look at it and kind of see 10 different things, which is both the beautiful but, but complicated thing about it. Um, to me, Ethereum is the following. It is an operating system for building better human institutions, right? which is very much about governance. But I would just caveat that by saying it's one which has not figured out how to govern itself yet. So there's a delicious kind of recursive irony in there. So we need help being better people and figuring these things out. Ready? Aki, go ahead. Yeah. So this is a question I've sort of been thinking about today, which is what are we governing? Like when we talk about governance, what exactly is being governed? Um, and I think that's a, a difficult question for blockchains um, because on one hand you have like this live distributed system where people actually use, but like is that the block? Is that what is being governed? I think that's a phenomenal question, and it's it's the main thing that annoys me when we talk about governance is it, we're never really clear about what we're talking about because. You know, Lane is uh, usually opposed to on-chain on governance, but if I say, you know, are you opposed to on-chain governance for selecting which pre-compile should be available or not, you would probably say, no, that's fine. Sure. Yeah, <laughs> so, I, I, yeah, like, there's right. very many different aspects of governance, like from super low-level technical, like, oh, should the wire protocol have a one or a you know, zero at, as the first byte, and no one actually cares. Uh, or All the way to founders' <laughs> rewards, or yeah. block rewards. When I, I have a talk on Ethereum governance, and I wish I had the slide here, um, but the first thing I talk about, like literally the first slide is what is Ethereum? What are we governing? And it's a fascinating question. I think I have something like 10 bullet points, right? So Ethereum is, uh, first of all, it's, it's the software. It's the client software, and there's multiple of those, right? Second of all, it's like a data structure with, with data in it, which is the Ethereum blockchain. Third of all, it's a trademark on the name Ethereum, right? Fourth is the community. Fifth is the foundation, which bears the name. Sixth is resources, right? So it's sort of all of those things. That's why it's so hard. But we need to be when we talk about governance, we need to be clear what we mean when we talk about governance, what we're trying to govern. So that's I a good think question. Governance isn't particularly <laughs> sort of super high level. I think, given that most of these platforms, all of them are currently not useful for, main, for the mainstream, like we're not governing any particular instantiation of a software or any particular instantiation of data that is sort of globally agreed on, upon. It's more that I think governance is really about figuring out as a community where you want to go. Um, so it's, I think governance is much more a question of finding a cohesive balance between people in the community that have a voice in governance, which in like Tezos is the coin holder set, um, and sort of for them to arrive at a decision on how they want to see that community evolve over the long term. It's not so much specifically about like the specifics of the protocol, I think. It's more like where do you want to go and what are ways to get there. It's a meme. Right? So, so sort of, yeah. in, a, in a word, if I had to explain in a word, like what we're trying to govern is this meme, this thing that we call Zcash or Ethereum or Tezos or whatever. And like for people that don't really understand how memes work, it's like it's more like a kind of like a nation state, like like a group of people that you, that you sort of have shared values and beliefs with, sure. and that you're like willing to stand up for and like fight with, but still like not kill each other. Depends on nation state, of course. Hopefully. Why don't we take another question? Yeah. So um, uh, on the future of Zcash funding. Um, Electric Home Company has intentionally, up to now, refrained from taking a, a public position, or a strong public position. Um, do you think that was the right approach? Um, should they have articulated sort of our internal um, opinions more, or left it more to the community? I okay. think you should have a strong public opinion on how much money you would want and what to do with that money. Like, not exactly, it doesn't make sense. But a thing that I see a lot is people have no comprehension for what goes into development work. Um, just like it's something that we see in Ethereum a lot, for instance, is people complaining that nothing is being done when there's no new features being shipped. But that doesn't mean that we're not doing anything. There's like a massive amount of work needed for optimization and, and maintenance of the software. Um, so I think conveying that you know this is the type of work being done is uh, important, and and stating that like we do, we feel that we deserve to be paid a salary. At the same time, uh, though, I think that's fair. I think waiting until you get you know understanding of the community also is wise. Like maybe it is. This is actually the question: like, should you come out with a statement, or should you first 
absorb some statement. I don't I think would, anyone's suggesting there should be a statement without listening to the I would say you without should come out with a, like, this is the lay of the land, like, this is the reality of what we're doing, but not put forth a proposal for, like, oh, we should have this block reward yeah. or whatever. Like, in the absence of any public statement, the public will just like assume, like the vacuum will get filled. Yeah. Um, so I think generally, it's, even though it's a way more terrifying position to take as a company, it's like I think if you have a very strong public stance that you like, are willing to stand by, um, that can work very well with communities. But at the same time, it's sort of like, well, what if we take a pro uh, strong public stance and then everyone hates us on Twitter? It's like, it's not great. On the one hand, sorry, I just want to add one thing. On, like, so there's, there's a, an optimization or a balance here, right? Like, on the one hand, I absolutely, absolutely understand and respect the desire to remain neutral because of decentralization, right? Because if it were the case that, uh, you know, any person or, or the organization, the, the company come forth and, and kind of like plant a flag in the ground and say this is what we stand for, it becomes a shelling point whether you like it or not, and it's in some sense kind of like could be perceived as centralized. But my fear is that you may have over-optimized in the opposite direction, and specifically the fear here is around uh, coordination failure. Right, that, uh, so we were talking about this last night, I won't say with whom, um, Chatham House rules, but uh, mm -hmm. that like, it may be the case that there's like 10 stakeholders and eight of them agree on what should be done, and yet without that shelling point, there's no mechanism for them to agree, and then funding doesn't flow and nothing happens. And that's the risk of over-optimizing over in the other direction. I completely agree with any void is filled with the conspiracy theories and yes. speculation. Yes, and new narratives get constructed, yeah. and those can take off. The number one, can we, can we coin the number one rule of crypto governance is what you just said. Any yeah. void immediately gets filled by conspiracy theories yeah. and knuckballs. Like, another, so I don't know whether this can be done in Zcash quite quickly or not, is to have multiple implementation teams. I think the fear of community is somewhat understandable if one, the main dev team, especially the one that got the Panos reward, comes out and says, like, we want more money, uh, that can seem very decentralized, uh, but I think the goal is to have multiple independent dev teams that have like that the community can then independently fund, because all of a sudden the community isn't held hostage by the same by the single entity effectively. And that is the case now that the foundation is moving towards doing that, which is really great. Thanks. This has been a really useful discussion and also fairly positive and free of paranoia. And I thought I would ask, like, do you have any thoughts on, I, I worry that some of our governance experiments are on easy mode and the challenges are kind of like natural disagreement, you know, within a group. Do you have any thoughts on like how to defend against I don't know, systematic corruption or against like deliberate infiltration attempts? Yeah, you just don't ever formalize anything, and then uh... that is definitely <laughs> that is definitely the wrong answer. Formalize everything. And Governance by obscurity. Uh, you, you, like the same that in like so definitely a a democracy, you need some way to determine who's eligible to vote. In the governance system, you need some way to determine who's eligible to participate in governance. If if you leave this open to everyone then you have a system that is easily undermined by three people on Twitter. Um, if you make the, but again, if you only do coin holder voting, then you have a system that's easily undermined by two VCs. Um, so you probably want to have something in the middle that is civil resistant, but still weighed by stake. I think one other point is, that, I mean, the reason I asked at the beginning what the size of the communities were is that it does seem like, I mean, the way you describe Cosmos governance, Tezos governance, they're live, they're a little newer, it's working good, but those are also much, much smaller communities. Smaller and younger. And so I think that's probably going to be the big question. It's like, it's, it's not like, tr do the best for this size, but it's what happens when it gets really big. And there, I, I don't know if there are examples. Look, there, this, there, this is really, way. it's really simple. There are no shortcuts to good governance, okay? So step one, admit that we know nothing, right? That we as a community, like, know very, very little about this, okay? That's step one, that's, that's step one in the 12-step process. We're not even close to getting there, at least in the Ethereum community. I can't speak to other communities. Step two, once you've admitted that you have a problem, learn from the freaking people who know this stuff, right? Like, there's an incredible community of scholars and legal theorists and political theorists out there who have been doing this stuff and writing about it and thinking about it for, like, millennia. Um, I'm, I'm trying to, to, to get smart, but I'm only one person and I, I don't have a background in this stuff. But, and, and so there are people who like are contracted to do things like write constitutions. These experts exist. Why don't we engage with them? Actually, speaking to what you mentioned, Frederick, like if the engineers are making the rules and building the rules, like should they be consulting with these type of groups as well? Yeah, I think so. Absolutely. absolutely. Bring those people yeah. in. And to, to Andrew's point about like what happens when this actually becomes a real, like when blockchain actually becomes a real thing, and there are if, if. Uh, there are billions of dollars, and like nation states are interested in, in usurping, you know, and coming in and taking over governance. The, the answer is we have no idea. Well, we've seen already in Ethereum, which is still small, uh, that 
large corporations with lots of money come in and do, you know, have a lot of lot of influence. Uh, the media has a lot of influence. Uh, like we we're not doing a good job in most communities today. And like Polkadot doesn't isn't live yet, so yeah, I, I can't say anything about how that's just, like how a fully formalized system would work. Uh, but you know, from Tezos and Cosmos, I think we've Hot learned. Print. I'm waiting. It's gonna be exciting. <laughs> we've learned that you know <laughs> things in this direction can work, and we'll see when it gets actually large. And, yeah. I think we have time for one last question. Okay. Hi. Um, so let's say that a network does introduce some sort of a development subsidy. Call it. Um, in your opinion, should the broader community, including the coin holders, like how much say should they have in how these funds are? then dispersed or how they're used, given that a lot of this work is highly technical and they may not actually have you know, the necessary expertise to make these decisions. That's Thanks. a really good question. Good, this, let me just it's be clear. Yeah. Final question. We, we have okay. 20 seconds, no. and the, no, question just, the question just asked is, how should we govern blockchains? <laughs> right? And we're not going to do that one justice. Chapter. I'm just going to say one thing, which is I don't, I'm not a fan of plutocracy. Right? So just having like coin holders do it, I think, is probably not the right way to do it, because you know, every time in history we had the wealthy govern, that didn't sort of end so well. But I don't have an answer. I mean, no, all, all throughout history. Like, when we have that. <laughs> you probably, and I think this applies to normal democracy in most cases as well. It's like um, you don't want to ask the individual voter uh, low level technical implementation details. Uh, you sort of want to arrive at a shared consensus, consensus of where you want to go, and maybe within sort of Zcash, this could be which teams to fund and sort of high level roadmaps of things we like, but most certainly not like who to hire, how much to pay them, whether the encoding, the new, whether we should write a new encoding library or not, and whether it should start with a zero or one bit. Like, those are all ridiculous questions to ask. Like, okay, the best example is Brexit. You don't want to ask people highly technical questions. That's like where they have no idea what the sort of like, where like 99% of the electorate have no idea what the long-term consequences of a zero or one are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would completely agree with that. Like, um, I, I would, like if I were just designing a practical system for uh, rewards, I would say you make a commitment for either like six or 12 months. Uh, you make it very high level. So each party that is up for uh, like election proposes a plan for the next six to 12 months. This is roughly what we want to achieve. You vote in some way, either through off-chain rough consensus or through minor voting or some other mechanic. Say 20% of funds should go to this party, 20% to this party. We don't want to pay anyone anything else, so we burn the rest. And then you have no influence on how that money is actually spent over the next six months. You, you have no you know, vote on like, which feature to implement or you know, anything that is that low level. It's just like, you know, here's some money, you, your plan looks good, and then you reevaluate six to 12 months later, did they actually you know, perform, like, implement this plan? It's a little bit like voting for a party. Yeah. Like a political party and every four years checking what they did. Guess what? We're, we're, we, we're reinventing the world and we're right back where we started. <laughs> Cool. Well, we're at time, and I want to say thank you all for joining. Thank you guys all for being here, and thank you all for joining us. I think we've just proven that it is possible to have a conversation about governance that is exciting and not angry. Did we lose any friends, or did we make friends? <laughs>